Good morning, everyone. I'm Rocco Landisman, Chairman of the National Endowment for the Arts. You know that. And the 177th meeting of the National Council of the Arts is now in session. I would like to welcome everyone this morning, council members, NEA staff, colleagues here in person, and everyone watching online at arts.gov. For the record, the council members who are present are violinist and educator Aaron Dworkin from Ypsilanti, Michigan. There he is. Uh, country music singer-songwriter Lee Greenwood from Nashville, Tennessee. Philanthropic professional Deepa Gupta from Chicago, Illinois. Our newest council member, Paul Hodes, about whom I will speak more um, in a minute. Uh, arts consultant, Joan Israelite from Kansas City, Missouri. There she is. Uh, arts patron, Charlotte Kessler from Columbus, Ohio. Author and editor, Brett Lott from Charleston, South Carolina. Musician, band leader, and composer, Irvin Mayfield, who is not here yet, I guess, uh, from New Orleans, Louisiana. Visual artist, Barbara Ernst Prey from Oyster Bay, New York. Uh, and film industry executive Frank Price from Los Angeles, California. Where's Frank? He, he won't be here. Okay. Uh, joining us by phone are museum director Jim Ballinger from Phoenix, Arizona. Is Jim on the phone? Okay, great. Uh, music director jo uh, Joanne Folletta from Buffalo, New York and Norfolk, Virginia. And not able to participate in today's meeting is Stephen Porter um, uh, and Emil, uh, em Emil Kang. Emil Kang has been appointed to, appointed to the council since our last meeting, but due to a family health emergency, he's unable to participate in today's meeting. Although he was sworn in and participated in the work leading up to this meeting, we look forward to having Emil's ceremonial swearing in and introduction at the March council meeting. Also since our last meeting, the president has announced his intention to nominate Bruce Carter, Renee Ramaswamy, and Olga Vizo to the National Council. They join Maria de Leon, Agnes Gunn, Maria Rosario Jackson, and, and Mas Masumoto, who have been previously announced and are in various stages of the Senate confirmation process, such as it is. But as I mentioned earlier, uh, we also have our newest council member who has been confirmed and is with us for his first meeting. So before we proceed further, I would like to introduce Paul Hodes. Paul represented New Hampshire's second congressional district from 2007 until 2011. Throughout his life, Paul has been both a performer and active member um, of the arts and, and entertainment community. He served on the New Hampshire State Council on the Arts as chairman of the board of the Capital Center for the Arts and Trissenham Limited, and as a board member of the Concord Community Music School. While practicing trial and entertainment law, Paul and his wife, Pego, won two Parents' Choice Awards with their band, Pegasus. Uh, Paul has also worked professionally as an actor, producer, director, and playwright. Uh, and I've known Paul for quite a number of years now. Um, I've met him in New York numerous times and have uh, followed his career. Um, and as a theater guy, of course, I have a special affinity for him. Uh, he graduated uh, from Dartmouth College and Boston College Law School with additional training at the National Theater Institute and the uh, Herbert Berghoff and Uta Hagen Studio. Uh, Paul, we are thrilled to have you with us, and even though you are sworn in to be able to participate in the preparations for today's meeting, uh, I now have the pleasure of publicly administering your oath of office. Would you please stand at the podium, raise your right hand, and repeat after me. <laughs> I, Paul Hodes, I, Paul Hodes, do solemnly swear that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States. Do solemnly swear that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies foreign and domestic against all enemies foreign and domestic that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same that I take this obligation freely that I take this obligation freely without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion and that I will well and faithfully discharge that I will well and faithfully discharge the duties of the office on which I am about to enter. The duties of the office on which I am about to enter. So help me God. So help me God. Ladies and gentlemen, please officially welcome the newest member of the National Council of the Arts, Paul Hurd. Thank you.
Paul, how about a, a remark or two? I'll keep them brief. Uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the Council, uh, staff of the National Endowment for the Arts, friends, uh, and all those who care uh, about the arts, uh, I am deeply honored to join the National Council on the Arts. In some ways, it's the culmination for me of a lifelong passion uh, pursuit. Um, the arts uh, are not uh, uh, a stepchild uh, to be thrown away and thrown around. Too often, um, I have seen the arts given second shrift uh, when it comes to budgets when it comes to consideration in the political arena. Uh, I think we need to see a real change in this country uh, about the arts, uh, the purpose of the arts, how the arts are viewed, how the arts are used, how the arts are integrated into our lives. Long after we are all dead, what remains are those beautiful things that we have created. Uh, so whether it is arts in education, uh, where I think the arts need to be elevated to the highest rank. They are the things to which everything else leads, that passion of creativity, that spirit of intelligence, the representation of the beauty of our souls, that which we live for to create a life, what the arts are about. Uh, whether it's in education or supporting the work uh, of the fabulous artists um, in this country, uh, this, the work of this council and the endowment uh, could not be more important, and especially at this time, because the arts build community, the arts bring us together, um, the arts are what we live for. So I'm, I'm really grateful, looking forward to my service. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Paul, for those very eloquent remarks. While we're doing welcomes, there is uh, one other individual whom I'd like to publicly welcome. Our new director of arts education, Ayana Hudson. Where's Ayana? Here she is. <laughs> very exciting to have her aboard. She's already doing some wonderful things, and I think we're going to be very thrilled with what she's going to be doing over the next few years. Um, we also have one farewell that I would like to acknowledge. Um, this is the part of the morning I was not looking forward to. Uh, Bob Frankel has announced that he will retire at the end of this month. I could not begin to articulate all that Bob has accomplished during his time here, nor the reach and respect that he has with the museum and visual arts communities at large. I mean, he gives us a tremendous amount of credibility and respect throughout that field. He's led a number of partnerships with other agencies, uh, including the U.S. Mint and the State Department, as well as a number of NEA initiatives, including our American Masterpieces Visual Arts Touring Program and the wildly successful Blue Stars Museums Program. Prior to his decade here at the Arts Entertainment, Bob had a stellar career in museums in Santa Barbara, California, Miami, Florida, Norfolk, Virginia, and Phoenix, Arizona. To recognize his contributions to the field, the Association of Art Museum Directors has just honored Bob by making him an emeritus member. One of our council members, Jim Ballinger, has worked especially closely with Bob. And Bob in fact, Bob takes all the credit for Jim Ballinger. <laughs> that was an aside. Uh, but he, I, I know his association goes back to Jim's early days in, in Phoenix. Uh, not only as a council member, but also through serving in our indemnity panel. Uh, Jim, I think, is on the phone. Uh, and I wonder if you might like to add anything uh, at this point. Thank you, Rocco. Uh, I'm sorry not to be able to attend this meeting in person. Um, 38 years ago this month, as, and when I was a recent art history graduate, I stepped off a plane here in Phoenix to interview for a job. At that time, I was met by Robert Frankel, the assistant director of the Phoenix Art Museum at that time. At Bob Certain, I did not think that uh, even when hired as a rookie curator that we'd be intertwined career-wise for the next so many years, which has made uh, such a great difference. But I have had a front row seat um, to watch Bob succeed in various positions with a variety of pressing needs while I stayed here in Phoenix. Um, 
and each had very special challenges. It's a testament to his wisdom and ability that each success led to a new challenge. He gained the respect of colleagues from coast to coast and beyond through the innovative programs and exhibitions he's uh, led. Uh, Rocco's already described uh, Bob's accomplishments with the endowment, but I can add as a member, a board member, and president of the Association of Art Museum Directors, where Bob has been an invited member for the last few years uh, after being a very participatory member, uh, that from the time he was appointed by Chairman Joya and the excellence he fostered in our field, uh, he has been a measurable difference. Uh, Bob, sorry I'm not in the room uh, to congratulate you for your great contribution to our field. Uh, you are a champion. And good luck to you and, and to Gloria, your great supporter, as you move forward. You will be missed by the council uh, as well as your colleagues across the country. Thanks, Jim. Um, and uh, although Bob strictly for forbade any public displays of gratitude, in fact, he was quite insistent on this, <laughs> and I tried to ignore him to the greatest extent possible um, with limited success, may I ask everyone here to join me in thanking Bob for his extraordinary service. Bigger ovation than the Book of Mormon got an opening night. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> okay, uh, back to business. Uh, may I have a motion to approve the minutes of our June council meeting? So moved. Okay. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Uh, any opposed? Thank you. Now we'll move on uh, to the council members' votes and their application and guidelines review. I would like to invite our Deputy Chairman for Programs and Partnerships, Patrice Walker-Powell, to take us through this section of the meeting. Patrice. Uh, my thanks to the two council members who are joining us by phone. And as you know, this section takes about five minutes or so. As we move to the application, guidelines, and review section of the agenda, just note that we've moved this section from the end of today's agenda to the beginning as Council Members Jim Ballinger and Joanne Folletta were unable to be here but agreed to join us for the vote by teleconference. The tally of the votes will be announced at the end of today's session. The Council will be voting by ballot today on 879 award recommendations totaling nearly $25.5 million in three funding areas, artworks, leadership initiatives, and lit literature fellowships. These funding recommenda recommendations are found behind the corresponding tabs in your council book. Please find your ballot in the folder. For the council members joining the meeting by teleconference, your ballots were mailed to you earlier this week. In order for your vote to be tallied, you must be present at the time of the motion, discussion, and vote. Council member, council member affiliations have been recorded in the council book and on your ballot. Each member has been provided an opportunity to update this information prior to the meeting. Before voting, council members should read the list of recommendations or protections provided, and if necessary, add to the list any affiliations that may be used. Council members are recorded as not voting on applications with which they are affiliated, and this list becomes part of the agency's official record. I will now provide a summary of the three funding areas, and council members will have the opportunity to ask questions and or discuss the recommendations before voting. After you've completed your ballot, staff will collect your folders and tally the votes. I have a motion to consider the recommended grants and rejections under the artworks, fellowship, and leadership tabs in your council book. Is there a second? Thank you. Now I will summarize these three funding areas, which, which require your vote. Pause for any comments or questions from the council members, and then finally ask you to mark your ballot for each category. First, 
the artworks category combines and replaces two previously distinct funding opportunities, access, <coughs> excuse me, access to artistic excellence and learning in the arts for children and youth. Artworks is the agency's core category for funding the arts discipline, and this category encourages and supports the following four outcomes. Creation, the creation of art that meets the highest standards of excellence. Engagement, public engagement with diverse and excellent art. Learning, lifelong learning in the arts. And livability, the strengthening of communities through the arts. These recommended grants are the first group of applications in this category brought to the Council for fiscal year 2013. The second half will be considered at the March Council meeting next year. Using rounded figures, in March 2012, the agency received 1,509 eligible applications requesting more than $74 million in fiscal year 2013 support. Recommended for the Council's approval, our 831 projects totaling up to $23,284,000. Grants are recommended to 55% of all applicants with amounts ranging up to $1,000, excuse me, up to $100,000, with an average grant award of $26,177. Recommended projects span 15 disciplines and fields. These grants focus primarily on the creation of work and the pre and the presentation of both new and existing works to American audiences. Creation and presentation takes shape in the form of commissions, collaborations, original productions, exhibitions, performances, tours, film festivals, artist residencies, literary publications, art in public places, and services to the field. Direct grants are recommended to 47 states, the District of Columbia, and Puerto Rico. Are there any comments or questions from the council? If not, please mark your ballot. Next, leadership initiatives. These awards will support a wide variety of all projects, excuse me, of projects of national and fieldwide significance. At this meeting, the council was requested to approve funding for eight projects and seven art disciplines or fields, totaling more than $1,190,000. Continuing support is requested for a statewide forum on careers in the arts for people with disabilities, any given child initiative in which members of a nationally led task force will work with city leaders and school administrators in multiple communities to develop long range arts education plans. Also, continuing support for professional development services for state arts agency directors of arts education the National Arts and Humanities Youth Awards, which honors and brings attention to model programs that celebrate the creativity of American young people and provides them learning opportunities. Support for a new initiative, a National Local Arts Agency Census, which will provide comprehensive, accurate, baseline data to help the NEA, the cultural policy field, local arts agencies, and the public better understand the range and extent of local, municipal, county, arts investments nationwide. Also, continued support for the NEA Jazz Masters Live, the presenting component of the NEA Jazz Masters Initiative, as well as for continuing support of writing workshops at the Walter Reed National Military Medical Center, part of the endowment's major initiative, Operation Homecoming. A national information services project that will assist the NEA in collecting, tracking, analyzing, and Supporting vital information that informs arts policy development at state, regional, and national levels. This includes federal art funds awarded through our state and regional partners, performance measurement data, and arts education statistics. Are there any comments or questions from the council? Please mark your ballot. Finally, literature fellowships. These fellowships provide writers with the time to create new work. Fellowships of $25,000 each are offered to creative writers in poetry and prose in alternate years. This year, 1,137 eligible poetry applications were reviewed. Panelists and staff are recommending 40 grants for poets from 22 states, totaling $1 million. Are there any questions or comments from the council? If not, please mark your ballot. Finally, there are several projects under the Awards Update tab in your council book. 
These grants have been awarded under the Chairman's delegated authority and are brought to the Council's attention at this meeting, but no vote is necessary. Included are one Chairman's Extraordinary Action Grant, totaling $17,500, 137 Arts Education and American Community Program Grants under the Chairman's Small Grant Authority, totaling $1.37 million. 12 National Arts and Humanities Youth Program Awards under the Chairman's Small Grant Authority, totaling $120,000. Two interagency agreements totaling $1,516,000. And two 20% amendments, each totaling $15,000. Thank you. We will now move to the guidelines review portion of the agenda. At this meeting, the Council was asked to consider two sets of guidelines. Literature fellowships closed for fiscal year 2014 and grants for arts projects for 2014. I will now turn to Jillian Miller, our Director of Office of Guidelines and Panel Operations, and she will summarize the guidelines up for vote at this, at this meeting. Jillian? Good morning. At this meeting, you're reviewing two sets of guidelines, both of which contain updates to existing categories. The first set of guidelines is for literature fellowship pros. These guidelines describe the agency's support for fellowships to published creative writers that allow the recipients to set aside time for writing, research, and other career development. And there is one change to highlight for you. We're combining the eligibility requirements for fiction and creative nonfiction under the umbrella of pros. Your second set of guidelines is grants for arts projects. For most of our applicants, Grants for Arts projects represents the full range of funding opportunities for the entire year. These guidelines offer support through two categories, Artwork and Challenge America Fast Track. This year, we're simply making a couple of adjustments in the Artwork category. We've renamed the Presenting Discipline, Presenting and Multidisciplinary Work, and we've added review criteria to address innovation and inclusion. Thank you, Jillian. Are there any comments or questions from the council members? If not, may I have a motion to approve the guideline? Second. Thank you. All in favor, please say aye. Any objections? Any abstentions? Uh, special thank you to our council members joining us via teleconference, and thank you all council members. Thanks, Jillian, and thanks, Patrice. We have a full, full agenda of some really exciting presentations, so I don't want to take too much time at the top of this meeting. But I have a few items upon which I'd like to touch on uh, briefly. Let me start off with a brief overview of my travel. To date, we've been to 38 states, and we've written at length about each of these trips on our arts blog, um, arts.gov. Uh, since June, I've had the opportunity to visit South Bend, Gary and in Munster, Indiana, the Storm King Arts Center in Mountainville, New York, uh, Chattanooga, Tennessee, and Newark and Rahway, New Jersey. There are two trips I'd like to talk about for just a minute because they were hosted by the chairs of our House and Senate Appropriations Committee. I was able to catch up with Representative Mike Simpson in Idaho right after Labor Day. Mike and I were joined by Esther Simplot, a local arts mega patron. Michael Faison from the Idaho Commission on the Arts, um, and Mark Huffland, head of Idaho Shakespeare and a former NEA council member. I was really blown away by, by how Boise has rebranded itself as an arts community. There were literally street banners in, down, in the downtown business district uh, proclaiming this, and all of the civic leaders have gotten involved with Trey McIntyre's dance company there, which is, we know has an international reputation. It's really astounding. And Mike Simpson continues to be both a staunch advocate for the arts as well as a close personal friend. Then in September, I was in Providence, Rhode Island with Senator Jack Reed. Jack is not only a military guy, West Point and Army, it also turns out that he's a huge theater fan. Jack and I were able to join a press conference that the Theater Communications Group was hosting. TCG was so inspired by our work with Blue Star Museums uh, that they decided to create an opportunity for theaters to get involved also. All of the TCG member theaters are being asked to consider doing some sort of military programming specific to their own communities. Some theaters are doing free tickets. 
Some are doing a discount. Others are doing special workshops or educational programs. And some are even um, going to do specific plays with military themes. Blue Star Theaters runs all year round and is open to any member of the military community, active duty, veterans, families, caregivers, and even those who are simply military supportive. In addition to Jack Reed and myself, the press conference included Governor Lincoln Chaffee and the highest ranking military official in Rhode Island, who happens to be National Guard. They launched uh, at Trinity Rep with 20 participating theaters and over the past six weeks have grown to 61. TCG's Blue Star Theaters program was inspired by the NEA's partnership with the Department of Defense, Blue Star Families, and nearly 1,900 museums across the country that offer free admission to active duty military families every summer. This summer, participating museums had 475,000 military family visitors. This is an amazing program in and of itself, and it has also, um, also opened the door for a lot of work between the NEA and the military including our Operation Homecoming program, which is now in place at the Walter Reed National Military Medical Center. I'm very proud of that. I also wanted to give a brief mention to the celebration we had for the NEA Heritage Fellows. These fellowships are the nation's highest honor in the folk and traditional arts and include an award of $25,000. This year's nine recipients were masters of diverse traditional art forms, including two that have never before been honored through the National Heritage Fellowships. Okinawan dancing, and dog sled and snowshoe building. In addition, for the first time ever, the NEA recognized a director of a state arts agency for his work in promoting the importance of the folk and traditional arts. The fellows gave an amazing concert, which is archived and available on arts.gov for anyone who wants to tune in. It really is an extraordinary display of talent. OK, that was a fair amount of material that I ran through fairly quickly, but I was eager to get to our three presentations today. First up, we have the truly extraordinary Elizabeth Streb. Elizabeth and I have crossed paths a number of times over the past a couple of years, and she was absolutely foundational in shaping my thinking about how arts organizations intersect with their community. In fact, I seem to mention her in almost every speech I give these days. Um, many arts organizations operate with a model similar to a church, come at a prescribed time and place to receive something that's good for you. On the road, I've often said that Elizabeth and her company eschewed this model and instead seemed to model themselves after a 7-Eleven and created a studio, studio that is open all the time and invited the public to drop in whenever they felt they needed a little something. This past summer, um, Elizabeth and her company represented the United States in the Cultural Olympiad, which complemented the London 2012 Olympics. Elizabeth was, in many ways, the perfect choice for this, since her dancers are the perfect embodiment of artistry and athleticism. But let me stop talking and have you hear from Elizabeth herself. And please welcome Elizabeth Stratton. Thank you so much uh, for that. I was blown away. I'm so honored. I think every theater should turn into a 7 Eleven, and then on the side, they do performances. Or, or, you know, and people don't really have to go watch it. Um, sometimes theater feels so punitive, you know. And when are we in the mood? I'll say. Anyway, that's not. <laughs> coming from you. Right. So, uh, I specialize, for those of you who don't know Streb, in extreme action. And I've been obsessed with figuring out what is the real move for the last 30 years now. Um, and I want to say the NEA, at the very beginning, after my first five years or so of trying to make action um, in the world, in Newton's uh, zone, uh, supported me and has really ever since. And, and this, I feel I'm coming home when I come into this room, I have to say. Um, you know, I, I said once long ago, if you want to be an artist, you have to lie, cheat, steal, and be a thief. But I, I'm not like that anymore, just so you know. So I'm, I'm interested in figuring out what are the questions, what are the things that the dance world, which is my home, um, has left out of the inquiry into figuring out how do you um, excise action 
to have it do in movement um, what it does best. Um, maybe the where things are is more critical than the what it is you're doing. It gets into the whole thing of, I think, perceptually, people sort of have developed a nomenclature for music, um, a, a rhythm structure for poetry, um, a way of thinking about music that I think when you watch action, you really don't remember what just happened, you know? So what, what Streb tries to do is to understand um, how to present action in a way that you're going to feel it. It skips your brain, goes right to your gut. We were asked by Ruth McKenzie, the mayor's office, uh, who headed up the Cultural Olympiad, and Justine Simmons, who is uh, London's Kate Levin. And uh, I was enormously, enormously honored. But I walked around, it was a two-year project, and I walked around London not really 100% understanding what I was going to do. And a lot of people who don't know Streb in London kept saying, oh, you're going to jump off bridges, it's a spectacle, oh my gosh, we're so excited. I go, no, no, I'm not a spectacle company. How do I figure out how to create a moment that is about human beings, action, heart, soul, mind? So that's a short survey of London. Um, to build up to that, I realized in those two years, I chose maybe 18 events along the Thames. You saw the little map of the Thames. And I wanted to um, go places on the Thames and understand what's going to happen when some people watching our action, let's say we're on the top of the London Eye, are 500 feet away when we're 400 feet up. What significance will the miniaturization of the human body have to people watching it? How do I present something that ends up making the human so tiny. The only possible relevancy has to do with the fact that we are there. This is the Park Avenue Armory uh, last December, and I thought I really had to ramp up to this. So in this place, you can see it's pretty huge, and I designed this show with projections and music and uh, my DJ, Zaire Baptiste, to have sometimes that experience where you're sitting 200 feet away from some of the action that's happening. And why will that matter? Why will that matter? And some of the events that we made, such as Ascension, which is we choose with our equipment. I believe that, you know, my action gizmos are the instruments of orchestras only for action. I, I truly believe the future of action art is going to need equipment. If you want to deal with pitch and movement, it would be altitude. You know, if you want to deal with a force, uh, rather than camouflage and gravity. There's just all of these different things. Then when I started to look at London, I decided I had to put this action in front of um, certain structures that would not distract too much with the action we're doing. Well, the National Gallery is, is a, a pretty um, competitive background. But see how perfectly the columns mimic the ladder? I think of this spinning ladder as a quotidian object, but also formally I think of it as a pure diameter. And this is human fountain. These are drawings. This is how I choreograph. And this is human fountain at the, at the armory. They're climbing too slowly. I'm going to skip it. <laughs> and this is human fountain in Trafalgar Square. And what's so strange is... Um, Every time we do our actions and then we come back to our actions, I think, can't you fall any faster? I mean, and then, you know, as Newton would say, no, not really. But of course, you know, once Einstein came along, um, Newton was wrong, you know. And do you remember that guy that just fell from the stratosphere? Do you remember him? Oh, is his name Brumgarten or something like that? Rhymes with? You know, he was going 900 miles an hour. We were discussing this last night, and I, you, you, you really, in, in the stratosphere, but once he hit, hit the atmosphere, you know, you can only go 130, because this is another subject. I won't get into it. My feeling is he did not break the sound barrier. So a couple things that I wasn't able to do. I wanted to put high-speed winches like this inside the tower bridge. These high-speed winches, I learned about this hardware, um, go, will drag a body, it's used in film mostly only, it'll drag a body 
30 feet a second. And then someone made the mistake of telling me, well, it could go 70 feet a second, but we do that to flip cars. I go, hmm, well, what would it do to a human? It would permanently injure them. So here's the odd thing about the journey in London. Look, we didn't know which ones they would approve. It was the most, for any normal, this is St. John the Divine, and we we're working, experimenting for the first time with the high-speed winches. But when, when, when I, you know, I thought, well, we started this, you know, it, it's enormously expensive. I like to talk about dollars and cents. So it costs $42,000 for one week to do this. Usually it takes me two years to make a dance, and they said, well, you, you have to make it right away. And um, we, the day before we went in here, we learned that the Tower Bridge was not going to happen. So it was that sort of thing. I mean, it's really a phenomenal experience to work with these things. So I decided, well, I have to make a tower outside the National Theater that's 100 feet high and do my Speed Angels. And some way, somehow, you know, that way I felt that the experimental money um, that we used was not wasted. Um, a couple, one other thing that I couldn't do, the, these, these empty plinths in the river, and I wanted to hurl my dancers back and forth over them. They said I could not do that, but I didn't know that. And six months before, I bought these air rams that when you step on them, they hurl you 40 feet. You cannot imagine how much fun that is. And I mean, have you ever, we, we call this falling sideways. But the weird thing is, when you're doing a project like this, I spent probably close to $45,000 on these air rams, and they wouldn't let me go over the plants either. I wanted to walk off the dome of St. Peter's and stand on the cross. And I had several conversations with the bishops that ended up just saying, no. Um, this is a dance um, that Trisha Brown asked me to do. Um, and I'm walking down the outside of the Whitney. This is in October. 2011 also thinking wow well one when I was doing this it's just when, when Trisha Brown um, in, reinvented the walk only on a 90 degree angle and pretty high up I mean well it was only 110 feet up um, all I was trying to do was walk and I know how to walk and I'm a trained dancer walking was the most complex thing all of a sudden all over again and it gave me, and you can see that, you know, you can kind of see that when you watch children try to walk. Well, not children, but things that are smaller than children, call them babies, when they first start walking. And all I wanted to do was honor Trisha's idea, which was to walk. And as you can see, I, I look pretty much like Frankenstein. So I got the opportunity to walk down um, City Hall, the mayor. We got tremendous uh, okays from the top. Um, the Millennium Bridge is where I wanted to do bungee dancing off the bridge, and this is another composition. Nice. That was 7.30 in the morning on one extraordinary day, and the dancers got to be taken away by these speedboats, so we had to close the river. This was the second event, walking down City Hall, and that happened at 10.30 in the morning, the next event. This is called Turn, and it was a build-up to the London Eye in Potter Nostra Square. So as you can see, St. Paul's is behind there, and I was hoping the bishops would come and feel bad they didn't let me walk down there, or rather walk off. And this is the section at one end of Trafalgar Square. and Human Fountain at the other. And the other interesting um, business idea was I could not, I was contractually unable to say when, where, or what. At all, ever. And it was supposed to, the audiences built throughout the day and they were supposed to find out. I still don't know how, how they found out. And the final event was on North High at 10.30 at night. And someday when we all go out for um, a chat, I can talk to you about those rehearsals at midnight the previous two, two days. Um. And, 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 the, and then I realized, finally, the only agenda that the mayor's office had, that London had, was that at Monday morning, the next morning, we would be in the front of some newspaper. We were in the front 
of the Times, the Guardian, and the Financial Times. Yes. And uh, I, I, I woke up that next morning and I just thought, you got to be kidding. My, my life is perfect. Thank you so much. Wow. <laughs> um, Elizabeth, thanks so much. I'd love to open things up for a discussion with our council members. Um, any questions or comments for Elizabeth? Well, Pretty you probably pretty. want to try some of the moves, right? And so I, I could just say you're always invited. Everyone here is invited to SLAM. Although we don't have all that equipment in SLAM, it's in trucks across the eastern seaboard. Um, but, um, any questions? I can just imagine yeah. the approval process you have to go through with all of the agencies and oh. security people and everything else. It was so it exciting. Be it was exciting, not yeah. frustrating? No, because. One of the things that artists do is talk just to people who already love us and believe in us, and but to talk to the rivermen and explain to them why the river needed to be closed, or or to talk to the engineer at the London Eye, and say, and I doodled on a piece of paper the first meeting. I said, "See, we're going to do a ballet on the spokes, and then we'll slide up and down the spokes at three meters a second. And don't you think that's cool?" And I was expecting that he said, no, and go. And he goes, yeah, no, that's cool. Let's do that. Wow. <laughs> well, who would have thunk it? You know, and I think one of my, my issues at SLAM is to realize that we have to walk up to people who aren't within our youth group and, and make partnerships and figure out. Like, sometimes I go to a party, not that often, and go up to the real estate developer and just see if I can engage him at practice. <laughs> I just wanted to say that I'm a, I thought the work was beautiful and I'm a big fan anyway. But I wondered, what was the reaction that you've gotten since then by people that don't normally, either who have never been exposed to your work before or who don't normally engage dance or movement in that way? Do you mean the, the uh, response on the streets of on London? The streets, yeah. It, it was just exceptional. You know, again, I was um, in my own cloud of terror because when I got to that day, and I, I didn't even see the London Eye. I, I climbed up to the hub and got strapped in there. And my rigger was putting people on the, on the foot plates to the spokes. And then they, they had 15 seconds to get on because it was moving. And I was in a dead sweat. All I cared about was just, you know, they had to stay on 40 minutes. And all I cared about, please come down, come down. It's over, it's over. And I just wanted everyone to be safe. Because we worked also with 15 London dancers. And I had 18 on these shows, so we had 33 dancers. So was the first time you guys were all of us together those two nights before? <laughs> I always get things backwards. Turn it off when I speak. No. No, we had a whole month there, but they were working for six months there in London. Um, we started with 20, and then they, they bailed up to 15. Um, and then we got together, and we worked together all 33 for a whole month. And they were, I, I thought that there's going to be somebody who's not going to get on the spoke. You know, they're going to say, no, I'm out of here. Not one person, not one person bailed. So it was heavenly. Yeah, Elizabeth, I am just blown away. This is one of the most extraordinary things I have ever seen. And I'm really curious about your involvement as an artist and, you know, how you got to this point with this kind of creativity. Could you talk a little bit about that? Well, I always thought that, you know, <clears throat> action had the power to occupy public space the way the visual arts does and has, you know, the gates and all of her lies in the waterfalls and whatnot. But it, but, but it, it, I don't feel has happened in that particular way where you can sort of anoint the skyline. And I was very, I was, that was my goal. It happened to work. But I think that those huge things, I mostly do my work in theatrical settings because that's where our economy exist. We have an agent and they tour us. But over the 30 years, I'm, I'm still investigating. It's just a series of queries. How, how can a human grab the attention of a passerby and, um, you know, have their mouths drop open without doing spectacles, but just representing, you know, what physical humanness. Thank you. One, one of the themes uh, for us here has been, uh, one of the terms we use is, is art in the public square. And it's, you know, what was fascinating about watching that was not only seeing the work, but the people 
watching the work and reacting to it because many of those people who are watching you will never buy a ticket to a dance performance or or, or museum or a theater or will, will never uh, formally access um, an artistic event, but yet are engaging it right there as a, as a member of, of the public. They're, it's, uh, it's free, it's right in front of them, and they're going to develop you know, an aesthetic appreciation and sense and, and a sense of excitement uh, without ever um, formally um, you know, purchasing anything. And, and that's, that's a tremendous leap, I think, that, that, that connects the arts with the, with the real world. Thank you. I think that for me, you know, it's um, taking over the world with action two minds at a time, maybe three now. But I, 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 don't you feel that the arts in the United States can be much more, much more ubiquitous and not necessarily smell or feel like the arts, you know, it's a goal. I think that's exact, exactly the point. You had a fantastic work. Um, you mentioned a couple times about and you use the word spectacle, that, that the work that you're doing is not spectacle. I was wondering if you could speak to how you define the difference between the art that you do and, and spectacle and or how others would define it. Well, I think that spectacle, one time we, we were invited to perform with Cirque du Soleil on their 20th anniversary in the street, so they mixed up circus acts and streb acts and all that. And I think that what I noticed then, and I've observed since then, that the grammar and syntax of the compilation of my sentences, my action sentences, have just simply a different, a different structure, a different architecture than the, it's temporal, you know, circus does something three seconds, two seconds, stop, clap, again, again, again. It's a different, it's a different idea, and the rhythm, um, the technical temporal rhythm of circus is different, and it's not that I intend to make more complex structures, but I try to possibly build sentences, maybe sometimes a paragraph, rather than articles and prepositions. And it's not, I, I have huge respect for stunts and circus, but I think that our categories are just a different sort of literature. Well, that was great. Um, and now, as they say, for something completely different. Um, <laughs> You can't get much more different than what we just saw. Um, over the past three years, I've been exceptionally proud of how we've been able to elevate and expand the work of the NEA's Office of Research and Analysis, and by extension, the entire field of arts research. From ongoing projects like the Survey of Public Participation in the Arts, to brand new endeavors like our interagency task force of 14 federal agencies around the arts and human development, we are seeking to examine all the ways that art works, and what exactly happens when it does. Back in May, the NEA, for the first time ever, co-convened a day-long convening with the Brookings Institution on the arts, new growth theory, and economic development. It was the first intersection between the NEA and Brookings, the first time we were ever invited to be at their table. One of my big takeaways uh, from that day was that there are an increasing number of serious eco economists who are taking the arts increasingly seriously, and, and that a major obstacle they face is having access to serious data. Toward that end, we began conversations with, with, one, of the, with one of the most serious agencies uh, we could imagine, the Department of Commerce's Bureau of Economic Analysis, the BEA, which is charged with calculating things like the gross domestic product, personal income and outlays, and consumer spending. They are the go-to place for all of those things. They also maintain a series of satellite accounts. Perhaps the two best known examples of this are the research and development satellite accounts and the travel and tourism satellite accounts, each of which, each of which look at a specific slice of the GDP. I'm pleased to announce that for the first time, the American creative sector will now be measured on a macroeconomic level by the BEA. The new account will identify and calculate the arts and the culture sector's contribution to the GDP. And think about that, it's the first time this is happening. This new satellite account will collect detailed information on a select group of arts and cultural goods, services, and industries, both commercial and not-for-profit, that are currently reflected um, in the GDP. This partnership with the BEA will give the arts the same level of precise national data on GDP as other sectors, like manufacturing, construction, and the service industry. 
It will be able to tell us national level data on the number of people employed by museums or theater production expenses or revenues at architectural firms. Additionally, the account can report figures on worker compensation in the music industry or the value added by the book publishing industry to the U.S. economy. The ARC satellite account will tap into data to which only certain agencies have routine access, and it will use the same methodology as existing BEA satellite accounts. In 2013, both the BEA and the NEA will release preliminary estimates on relevant creative and cultural industries, including estimates on annual outputs, such as revenue and expenses, direct and indirect employment, compensation, and value adds, which refers, to an in, which refers to an industry's contribution to the economy through its labor and capital, excluding material and energy costs. In 2014, BEA will release final estimates and publish the findings in the Survey of Current Business, a key publication for leaders in economics and policy. I'm thrilled today that we are welcoming BEA Division Chief David Washausen, who will talk more about this important work. Please join me in welcoming David Washausen. Wow. Well, uh, thank you very much, Chairman uh, Landisman. That was very well said. And uh, perhaps I don't know that I need to go into how, how much detail after you've just given that wonderful introduction. Uh, thank you to the other council members as well for inviting me here to speak today. Uh, as well as Sunil, of course, whose tireless efforts for the past year or so have uh, allowed us to come to this point, to, to reach this exciting agreement. Um, boy, tough act to follow <laughs> with Elizabeth's uh, presentation. Part of me thinks maybe we should just put that up uh, and we can watch that again because that was just fascinating uh, and wonderful. And, and I was actually nervous watching you walk down that building face first thinking, oh my gosh, that's that looks crazy. <laughs> you too. Anyhow, uh, but it really, I don't want to mitigate too much from, from what's at stake here. This really is a very um, exciting collaborative effort between BEA and NEA, um, all the way up to the top levels of BEA. The director, Steve Landefeld, is, is very excited about this, um, as are the people that, uh, that are going to be directly working on this. One of which I want to introduce real quick, Paul Kern, who I brought with me here today. He's uh, sitting in the second row, and, and he's sort of the face of this project and has been at the forefront with Steve and uh, uh, with Sunil and, and, and Paul's team. So uh, when you start to hit me with very detailed, tough questions, I'll, I may very well defer to, to Paul in my remarks. So, so this is very new. Um, it's been in the works for about a year, but we really just recently came to this official agreement to do this. So unfortunately today, I don't have a whole lot of detail to provide to you. Instead, my plan is to talk a little bit more about, well, what does BEA do? Um, what sorts of products? Who are our data users? And then what a, why do we generally engage in these satellite accounts? What, how are they different from the core accounts? And what's the purpose of, of a satellite account? And then toward the end, just talk a little bit more uh, about what we envision for this arts and cultural production satellite account. Prior to joining the industry division, um, I spent about 20 years in the national economic accounts. So um, Rocco mentioned that I was chief of the industry sector division, and I, I joined that group about a year ago, a little less than a year ago. And prior to that, I spent a long time working on developing new measures of capital. And one of the fascinating new areas that the, the global statistic community is looking at is the area of intangibles. And this really dovetails very well with this new uh, satellite account for arts and cultural production. In the old way of looking at capital, we typically think of things like cars, computers, trucks, tangible equipment and plants and buildings. But in the last uh, 15, 20 years or so, we've started to open that up and to include intangible assets as part of the asset within um, the economic framework of measuring productivity. And that's important because when we start to recognize these intangible things as asset, it raises the level of GDP, and it also raises the awareness level of these types of transactions. So, so what are we talking about here? We're talking about software, talking about R&D as capital, and most germane and relevant to this group, we're talking about artistic originals. 
and BEA will recognize artistic originals, things like original music, original books, original movies. Um, we're going to recognize that as capital in the national accounts beginning with this year's comprehensive revision. And, and that will likely raise GDP by uh, anywhere from 50 to 70 billion dollars. So it's, it's big money and it's important that, that we're recognizing these types of transactions as capital and moving away from the traditional notion of just being something tangible. Okay, so as I said, I don't plan on getting into a whole lot of detail for this arts and cultural production satellite account because we just don't have that detail yet to give. Um, and instead what I want to do is just talk a little bit about who is BEA and again what, what we're talking about with these satellite accounts. So we're actually, the Bureau of Economic Analysis is, is a pretty small agency, about 500 people um, and in fact the industry sector division that I oversee and will be producing the satellite account along with all the other products that we do, it's only about 25 people. So, so we like to consider ourselves a, a fairly lean, mean fighting machine. We're, we're a small group and we really enjoy what we do. So BEA, uh, in the broader sense, produces uh, economic statistics to better inform the nation on, on how, we're, um, how the nation's productivity is. And, and primarily we're talking about GDP, uh, gross domestic product. Um, so in, in fact, I don't know if anybody caught it, but this morning we released GDP for the third quarter. It's the last release before the all-important election. And a free cup of coffee, if anybody can tell me what the uh, increase in GDP was this morning. You got it. <laughs> Dang. Starbucks? <laughs> Starbucks, okay. A Coke, you got it. Without a hesitation. Wow, so yes. A little bit. Yeah. Uh, there was a fair amount of growth in consumer durable goods, which, which is good. It means consumers have, have confidence. And it was a slight acceleration from the previous quarter, which was 1.3%. So... Um, at any rate, so that was released this morning, and and that really is the uh, the featured the featured uh, measure of the BEA estimates and sort of the the cornerstone and the foundation of what we do. And this arts and cultural production satellite account will directly tie into GDP and will show its contribution to GDP. So the the other thing I would mention real quickly is that so as that first bullet states. We're part of the Economic Statistics Administration within the Department of Commerce. Uh, the other agency that's part of this Economic Statistics Administration is the Census Bureau. And of course, the Census Bureau is, is quite large, uh, and BEA relies heavily on Census Bureau data to produce all of our statistics. Okay, so who uses the BE measures? Well, we like to thank everybody. Um, and these are not necessarily listed in order of importance, but. Uh, so the White House and Congress certainly use our statistics and uh, for, for things like setting projections of, of GDP growth and looking at uh, for setting tax policy and doing budget projections. The Federal Reserve uses our statistics uh, extensively for setting monetary policy and looking at industrial production, which the Federal Reserve is charged with doing. Uh, Wall Street, very interested in what we Trade associations are very interested in particular in the industry analysis that my group does to see how certain regulations uh, and, and uh, trends and interactions between industries has, is evolving over time. And of course the business community uh, pays close attention to what we do as well as academia. So just very quickly, um, these, are the, these are the core accounts within BEA and we've got the national accounts the industry accounts, the international accounts, and the regional accounts. Um, so the national accounts is where I spent uh, my first 20 years at BEA working on, on those uh, capital measures and, and uh, including the intangible. The, the acronym actually for the national accounts is the National Economic Accounts, and so the acronym is NEA, and boy did that cause a lot of confusion in talking to people at BEA and what do you mean you're giving a presentation at NEA? We've got a release today. I didn't know anything about this. So, If at all possible, maybe we can talk about renaming the National Endowment for the Arts to something else. <laughs> kidding. Anyhow, uh, so the takeaway here is the national accounts and the industry accounts and the regional accounts and the international accounts are all highly integrated within BEA. GDP is the, is the cornerstone of our estimates and all four of these core areas work very closely with one another. 
the satellite accounts are generally the responsibility of the industry accounts. Uh, and these, get to the satellite accounts in just a minute, but in these satellite accounts you can think of, you've got this large set of, of economic accounts that include an input-output table, which shows uh, the, the uses and the production of goods and services and how they interact from industries for the entire economy. So you've got this large set of economic accounts. And then a satellite account is just sort of a mini version of this larger set of economic accounts. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Uh, so this slide, just, just very quickly again, we're, we're talking about GDP and I've given you the textbook definition that, that you would get from Econ 101 of what GDP is. So it's simply defined as the market value of goods and services produced by labor and property located in the United States. And uh, the second item here, the salient point, is that um, the input-output table, which again is produced in, the, in this industry uh, directorate, is the cornerstone of GDP and forms the, the benchmark level estimates every five years. And in fact, this is something that we're working on right now for 2007 and plan to release um, at the end of 2013. Okay, so what are satellite accounts? Um, so uh, as the slide says, it's a framework designed to expand the analytical, analytical capacity of the national accounts without interfering with their general purpose. So again, I kind of look at this as we've got the core set of accounts here, and then we have a set of satellite accounts that sort of revolve around the core accounts. And wh what this allows us to do is it gives us a lot of flexibility. I was explaining this to someone last night at dinner, I don't recall exactly who, and they used the term, maybe it was Joan, using the term laboratory. And, and that's, a, that's a great way to describe these accounts because in a sense they are a laboratory and it allows us to experiment in these satellite accounts without disrupting the core GDP accounts. So two different reasons why we actually have these satellite accounts and one of them is indeed this laboratory setting. And so. Um, Chairman Landisman mentioned research and development as a satellite account and that's a perfect example of, of a set of estimates that we want to put into this experimental laboratory. R&D is, as you can guess, a massive um, set of transactions that have tentacles that touch all facets of the accounts. There's, it's just, it's unbelievable once you get into the details how widespread it is. And so by first putting it into a satellite account, talking about recognizing it as capital again. So by putting this into a satellite account, it allows all of our data users to get a handle on well, what is this going to mean once we actually bring this into the national accounts. Or, hey, you guys, you overlooked this. So it's sort of an opportunity to allow academics, business, uh, other, other statistical agencies in other countries to review these results and provide us feedback before we actually incorporate this into the core GDP accounts. The second type of satellite account is more consistent with what we're talking about here with the arts and cultural production satellite account. And that is, it allows us to create a set of estimates at perhaps a finer level of detail that we wouldn't have otherwise presented to the public to focus on a certain set of transactions and activities, in this, this case being arts and cultural production. A good example of where, where we also do this is, again, the travel and tourism account, which uh, Chair, Chairman Landisman also mentioned. This is an area that uh, Paul Kern has worked on for about 10 years and, and, and we work with um, the International Trade Administration to put together this set of estimates that show the impact on employment uh, both direct and indirect and output from travel and tourism. And this of course is a, a popular uh, topic right now with the White House and others because they're looking to see how we can create more jobs and and how exactly does travel and tourism relate to employment. And, and we'll be looking at similar things with this arts and cultural production satellite account, really just to get a handle on, let's quantify what we can, what exactly is it that we're talking about here. Okay, so, so we've been, so this is somewhat repetitive. We've talked about this. The framework for this satellite account is going to be an I.O., in other words, an input-output framework. Um, so this is, uh, for our full-blown set of accounts, we're talking 10,000 different detailed items. 
uh, one of the biggest challenges in developing this arts and cultural production satellite account is going to be to identify within those thousands of different commodities and transactions, which of those do we want to include in this satellite account? Now, some of them are going to be obvious. Some of them are not going to be so obvious. And in those cases, I think we're really going to have to look at, so there'll be portions of something, perhaps, for example, construction. Well, some portion of construction likely belongs in the satellite account. We certainly wouldn't want all of construction in the satellite account, because that would just blow everything else away. So in order to lend credence and, and um, you know, real believability into these estimates, I think we have to be very careful in terms of what we're going to include here. And I envision this being um, really the time consuming and the, and the real work of this particular account. And we're going to work closely. It'll be a very collaborative, uh, iterative process, I envision, with uh, Paul and his team working closely with Sunil and his team to really identify what types of things we want to include in these accounts. So uh, let me just reiterate one point that we're, we're talking about extracting, splitting off, um, and, and essentially compiling transactions that are already reflected in GDP at this point. So we're not, we're not talking about things that are going to add to GDP as a result of this account. Talking about market transactions. There's a whole other element, potentially, to measuring the value of arts and culture, obviously. There, there's, a, there's a huge intangible that's very difficult to measure. And that's not going to be reflected in the satellite account. So I think we need to do a very good job explaining that when, when this account is released. And in particular, I think Sunil and his team will want to be very clear that this is only, these are only the market transactions that are, that are reflected in GDP. So what products do we plan on providing? Um, so as Rocco mentioned, in 2013, BEA and NEA will release preliminary estimates for the following items. We'll have estimates of annual output, a detailed arts and cultural production satellite account industry. That acronym just doesn't flow. A ACPASA. <laughs> uh, and by output, what we're talking, I keep using the term output, and I realize that's BEA speak. Might not really be clear on what output is. But so output, we're referring to essentially sales and receipts. And that, that is the core measure of output. And then, of course, employment, the all-important employment and compensation. And then the value-added estimates. And, and uh, value-added is essentially GDP. So what you can think of is so gross output is going to also reflect all those uh, intermediate inputs that go into producing something. So we have to subtract those in order to get a concept of GDP or value-added. And then in 2014, BEA and NEA will release the final set of estimates. And we will publish an article in uh, BEA's monthly uh, publication, The Survey of Current Business, which goes out to you know, thousands of people and is in libraries across the nation and hopefully uh, widely read. Uh, and so there'll be an article that will be jointly authored by uh, NEA and BEA presenting these estimates and the methodologies that we've used to develop these estimates. Okay, so I always like to have a chart in any presentation that I do. Uh, unfortunately, I, I can't give you a chart that's specific to or relevant necessarily to the arts and cultural production satellite account because we're just, we're just nowhere near that point yet. But this gives you a flair for the types of charts that we publish for uh, one of the other satellite accounts, the travel and tourism satellite account. So, um, you know, we see the components here. I don't know if you can see that in the back, but you can see the contributions to the annual growth rate uh, in overall tourism and output, and we give you the components. So traveler accommodations, the hotels and motels, the food and beverage services, transportation purchases, and then the recreation, entertainment, and shopping. So again, we're talking about trying to quantify uh, all of these types of activities and transactions in the economy. Not as exciting as acrobats and dance, not acrobats, but dancers on uh, ladders swinging and walking down buildings. I, I realize that. Okay, so in conclusion, finally. Uh, so we, as I said right from the outset, we, we are really excited about this. Um, 
know, being able to speak to a group like this, I don't, I don't get to do this very often. I'm normally speaking with statisticians and economists, so uh, you know, this is really wonderful for me to be able to, to meet with you people, with you all, and speak with you all about this particular project. I'm, I'm really interested in, in feedback. Uh, and BEA is really excited about this. It's, it's a little bit different from what we would normally do, and uh, and this is important stuff. It's important to try to measure uh, these types of transactions. So, uh, just real quick, so the arts and cultural production they play an increasingly important role in the economy and the well-being of Americans. The increased emphasis on measuring these intangibles is pervasive, not just within BEA but for the world in the global economy. Uh, other international organizations are also recognizing these artistic originals and R&D as capital. In fact, the next phase is potentially human capital, which is a really daunting task. With, uh, stop and think about it, recognizing human capital. And we hope that the, uh, this production satellite account will promote a better understanding of the impact on the U.S. economy of, of arts and cultural production, naturally. And we think the benefit will be wide felt, will be felt throughout uh, both business community, academic community, and government agencies that, that need to have a better handle on these types of statistics. All right, thank you for your time, and uh, thank you very much. David, thanks so much. And I'd love it if our Director of Research and Analysis, Sunil Iyengar, could join us for a discussion with our council members. So let me op open this up for questions for both David and Sunil. And Sunil, any Thank remarks? You. Well, uh, first of all, I wanted to, since, since David was able to uh, introduce his staff who we were working on the project, I, I wanted to single out uh, Bonnie Nichols, whose initiative and brains. If you could just wave to us, Bonnie. Uh, a little higher. <laughs> Uh, whose initiative and, and really her, her know-how have really propelled us forward here. Um, you know, we can fantasize all we want about what we want to achieve for the arts in terms of solid data infrastructure, but to have someone who can walk that, excuse the dancing, or, uh, the metaphor there, a bridge, you know, between um, what we know about the arts uh, through, through tried and true experience of collecting our own data and working with what we know in theorizing about uh, measurements of the arts to actually, you know, knowing about which codes in, at the BA or which, you know, data points are those that are likely to yield us the most benefit. So she's going to be integral in this process and as are other people of my staff. So that's uh, great. But uh, we're really excited about this. This is a landmark opportunity as you presented. Um, I have one question. Um, which, which is that uh, when you're measuring these, um, when you're taking these measurements, I assume, David, the measurements are of actual transactions that relate to the arts themselves. So you'd be measuring uh, in a theater uh, ticket sales, salaries for the ushers, the actors, uh, administrative staff, etc., but not the revenue in the parking lot next door or the dry cleaner that's cleaning their goods or or um, you know, all the ancillary economic, all the ancillary aspects that have an economic impact. Um, so, like a good economist, the answer is it depends. <laughs> uh, I, so, there will be some type of activity like that. For example, a manager, um, that ma an, an agent that manages uh, a dancer or something, that activity would be, would be included in the satellite. The dry cleaner that's cleaning the uniforms or the, the costumes, no. I don't envision that, in there. but I think that the takeaway right now is that we really we haven't had a good chance to sit down and identify what exactly should be included. There will certainly be some indirect transactions in this account, um, and that's really going to be where the tricky part of this project is going to come in. Because one of one of the points, of course, is is that the arts have a tremendous indirect impact through the whole entire support system that that that, that fosters it. So, so Rocco, I would just add to that that I think um, what I've seen so far from the preliminary work that's gone back and forth with BA, and we're going to have a meeting on Monday with them, uh, there's there's certainly a high potential for a proportion of those kinds of activities to be reflected in the account. What we can say, though, is it probably isn't as expansionist, say, as some other studies where indirect effects are really the focus of economic impact at the local level, for example but it will be a much more clearly defined, transparent way to account for those 
uh, elements, and therefore, you know, would at least be a, establish a baseline for, for for reviewing that information in relation to direct impacts going forward. So we will have some of that, I know. Um, yes, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit more about what you mean by artistic originals, and you know, is that the whole component, or is it a, a portion of what you're measuring? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, so th this notion of artistic originals is um, somewhat new, and we can think of it as being separate from this arts and cultural production satellite account project. Uh, it certainly dovetails well with it, but what we're talking about here is so the value of an original movie, the value of original music, the value of an original book, or a value of an original television show. Up till now, the, the value of that intangible has sort of been ignored in the national account. And what we've said is, well, you know what? That's actually an asset because the value of that original movie provides a service, a stream of income uh, over a period of time. So we're going to recognize those types of products as assets in the national account. And that will happen uh, at the end of um, this year when we introduced 2013 the comprehensive provision of the national account. So in terms of the arts and cultural production satellite account, that new set of capital will work its way into the arts and cultural production satellite account, but it's not the only aspect of it. I had uh, just a few questions, uh, if you can indulge me. Uh, hopefully they'll be pretty quick. The, what will be the level of geographic breakdown that will be available from the results and um, the employment sector breakdown? Will, will people seeing this information be able to break that down to a great level of specificity? Uh, the plan right now is, is not to have any detail for geographic, uh, any, any sort of geographic dimension to this data. The other set of accounts, the BEA, another, another one of the set of the accounts is the regional accounts that I mentioned in one of the slides. And, and they would be the ones to try to introduce a regional aspect to this account. That's not in the works right now, uh, but that's not to say that's something that couldn't come down the road. Uh, in terms of the detail on the type of employment, I might kick that to Paul. Um, I, any, anything you want to add in terms of what we plan to do for employment detail? Paul, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. Do you mind coming to the mic? Apologize. Sure. So the, the actual structure of the industries has not been determined yet, but, um, and I'm going to throw out a phrase that I hate to use, but I think I have to use it. Something about a six-digit NAICS level, so a fairly detailed industry. NAICS is North American Industry Classification System. N not a widely known acronym, but very, very, very important to the work that we do. So one of the initial projects, and we're actually going to meet Monday, is to set the item list. And the item list, so from the benchmark I.O. table, we will look at nearly 9,000 items. Of those 9,000 items, we'll have to decide, is this artistic, is this cultural, or does this help disseminate art and culture. And if it does some of those things, we will place that into our basket and say, okay, that item is clearly in the ACPSA, therefore the industry that produced that item should be in the ACPSA, therefore some or possibly all of the employment in that industry should be in the ACPSA. So it, it starts at the item level and then we back into the industry and then back into the number of employees required to produce the output that created the item that ended up in the basket. So I think, and that kind of leads me to just my last uh, question, which is there's obvious interest involved in terms of what the conclusion is and what the numbers are. Um, who is the ultimate determiner of what is going to be included? Can I, can I take uh, a, oh, go ahead. Yeah, yeah I, I was just going to say that again. Uh, we're going to work together, and and uh, we're going to collaborate. We're going to come to a mutual agreement in terms of what should be included. And, uh, 
I, you know, I, I'm confident that we'll be able to do that. And just to be or sort of if you alleviate anyone's concern that there are just you know two offices in this vast country that are going to be screening up this, it would actually be also very heavily reliant, as as has communicated with several times, on their their methodology for determining those things for other satellite accounts. So there are some parameters, but also in terms of proceeding other accounts that have been done, physical frameworks that have been developed in other countries. Uh, we, we've been doing, so part of their work has been actually reviewing a lot of those, those accounts to get a handle on what the taxonomy is. And then we will sort of look at the evidence of what has been reliably, defensively collected over time in relation to what we would like to see in the account. So I'm hopeful that there will be many of these inputs through this process coming all the way from you know, staff at the NEA, you know, from your staff and others, and also um, at the BEA. So there will be that dialogue. I if I could, say, go ahead. Um, I wanted to clarify about the, the geographic dimension that is of, of large interest in this account. BEA has a lot of experience in regional economics. For an account like this, it's very important that we get it right at the national level. So we get that total correct, get the industries correct, get the items correct. And then as we move forward, future years, future agreements between BEA and NEA, then potentially we could drill down and provide a regional dimension. But we have to get that national number right first. I also just had a few questions, if you don't mind. Um, one of them is uh, related to the question of what other countries are measuring, what kinds of satellite accounts they might have that would parallel what you all are developing. So obviously, there is an interest in that kind of comparison as well. Is it okay? Okay. Well, um, Spain and um, Bonnie can go like this if I'm wrong, <laughs> but, but Spain has clearly developed one, uh, and also uh, Finland. And, um, and, and in terms of just to be in Brazil, Brazil, these are three. But one thing that, that I think has been borne upon us is that we, unlike many other countries, actually have existing data sources for most, if not all, of the things we're trying to put into the account or, you know, put the spotlight on. Many of these other countries will have to do their own new data collections, new surveys to try to collect this information. So it's almost more aspirational in some cases. There are also uh, Canadian, the Canadian Statistical Framework, UNESCO, where it's not so much a satellite account as a designated list of industries, goods, and services that they believe belong in the creative or cultural sector. So some of these may place more emphasis on what they call the creative sector versus what we are in arts and cultural. But we, of course, recognize explicitly in this agreement, actually, that arts and cultural, uh, this arts and cultural sector is, in, is perforce creative. And, and we are going to be calling out the creative elements uh, in many of these industries, like advertising, design, and pulling out those, essentially applying ratios to come up with which proportion of those total businesses are, would be considered relevant to the arts. We're, I think we're, we're very inspired, I'll just say, by the Canadian statistical framework. So people want to look at that document. If you want to look, just pour through it. I mean, there, there are definitely some, some neat ways of classifying some of these kinds of things, such as foundations, arts education. How do you put all that in there? And, um, my last question was on what Aaron was talking about, which is that uh, in terms of the use and understanding of this information, um, there are others, I think you were alluding a little bit to the Americans for the Arts report that comes out on economic impact, uh, where they look at things like travel and tourism. Uh, so I, I guess what I would just say I'd be interested to know what the communication strategy or, or kind of the rollout of this is to be so that organizations understand the limitations of the use, uh, decision makers at the policy level, but also at the private sector level will understand how they can use this information and what they should look forward to in terms of breakdowns by employment geography or other ways, so that you know, it can actually be more integrated, not just by arts organizations, but also by other class industries organizations. No, thank you. Um, I think as Dave said, you know, it's going to fall on us collectively to, to figure out how to communicate what we can't capture, because we all know that even if we are as comprehensive and as detailed as possible, uh, 
monetary value is only one way to talk about and really truly quantify what the benefits of the arts are. And, and you know, that's an emphasis area that we've been putting a lot into, but we also recognize through other means of talking about value, you know, time spent, uh, you know, experience itself, and how do you measure those. So, so we will be very cognizant, hopefully, about that. Um, and, uh, you know, we, in terms of, I know that organizations such as Americans for the Arts and others have focused on local economic impact for the most part. And so, to this degree, until we get more geographic detail, we hopefully will provide the national portrait as we do with a lot of our other surveys. I would just add one thing. In that, um, so we're going to be putting this together following all of our established methodologies for a full blown set of input output tables. So I'm not creating new methodologies again. I, I think coming back to uh, Aaron's point, the real tricky part here is going to try to figure out, it's quite subjective, which sets of commodities and transactions belong in this account. That's going to be the hard part in this. It's going to take a while, and it's a great question uh, in terms of what do you do at the end of the day if you just can't agree in terms of what goes in there, and, and we'll have to cross that bridge when we get to it. Once we have that, I think that we'll then point users to methodologies that we already have out there for putting together these statistics, uh, because they'll largely be consistent with what we're already doing. What about the um, measurement of length? So let's say publishing be really unique. Someone published, created a piece of music published 50 years ago. It turns platinum every year. And maybe it also inspires, I don't know, 150 more recordings of that kind of work. How does, how does the, are you talking about original pieces, but how does something that maybe have a real economic impact right now, but was created 50 years ago, measure into what you're talking about? Yeah, I mean, so to the extent that that type of activity would generate market transactions, which it would, then those types of transactions would be reflected in the census source data and would get picked up into our account. But the concept of the artistic original is a little bit different in that regard. Uh, and in fact, when, we, when we're measuring the value of that artistic original, we're not able to rely on market transactions because artistic originals are not sold in general. They're, they're not sold on the market. Instead, you see a stream of revenue that results from that artistic original. So there, um, right phrase, but there we're, we're a little bit out on a limb in terms of how we're going to measure the value of the original. And we're relying on uh, sort of projected revenues and net present value without getting into a whole lot of math speak, but we're relying on some, some less straightforward, more sophisticated measures to value that artistic original. But that's a little bit different than what we're talking about with the arts and cultural production satellite account at this stage. So to the extent that uh, Duke Ellington, some, for whatever reason, someone is, uh, there's a reprisal of interest in, in artists that was developed 20 years ago, generates new sales, that gets picked up as part of the source data. I'm sorry. Sorry, just one, because obviously it's very interesting. Uh, and so just one last question is, will, will there be a distinction between um, both what's put into the account, but also then how this is rolled out in terms of uh, a distinction between arts and culture and the creative economy. Uh, to the extent that, um, in other words, a sort of a distinction between direct versus indirect, is that what you're asking? Versus, will people look at this study and say, well, this is really measure, uh, you know, measuring uh, Creativity, I mean, as opposed to arts and culture. The distinction between the definition of arts and culture versus creativity. Right. I, can, I can say that to a large degree, this went into our conceptual framework that we worked out to get to where we are with this agreement. Was we want to be very clear that these items reflect creativity as a key component of this whole thing. So, to just be very clear, yes, we're, it's the arts and cultural production satellite account, but I think it will be rapidly very apparent once we get to others, once we get the, to these items and drill down into them, that is very much part of the heart of our creative industry you know, as a country. Um, what we are trying to steer away from a little bit is because there are many kind. there's a public, there's a lot of, kind of diff, uh, alternative con concepts about creative sector, and it's not always art, arts and culture. I think it would be, be almost a stretch sometimes to 
to, to be able to call some things, uh, you know, think of it as the art when it's creative in some cases. You know, there's certain types of science, you know, et cetera. So we are not, we, we, don't, we do want to draw the line by saying arts and culture and making that clear in how we package this. But I think it's going to be very obvious that there are elements of this that are heavily creative and perhaps drive the creative economy. Does that sort of help? Yeah, uh, it just, um, I think whatever we can do so that when this is rolled out, um, there isn't the, the space for people to, uh, when, you know, when organizations may want to say, well, here is the importance and the value of arts and culture for people to have any validity in saying this really isn't a measure of arts and culture, it's, it's this broader aspect and arts and culture is a part of that. I think as much as we can pinpoint this so that it can be a, a, a better resource and a better uh, assessment of the impact of art and the value of arts and culture, that, that would be important. Absolutely. I think I think we're going to have to draw that stake and put that stake in the ground and really make clear that distinction and try to be, have fidelity to it. So yeah. Well, thanks very much, David. That was fascinating. As you could tell, there's a lot of interest in this subject. And, and, and we are very, very happy um, to be at your table and to be, uh, to be included. And uh, it's, it's very important for us. Thank you. Thanks, Neil. Okay. Um, and one more round of applause for Elizabeth, who has made an incredible presentation. <laughs> I think it's one of the most fascinating sessions we've had yet, and, and more to come. Uh, when I talked with Alice Myatt, the NEA's Director of Media Arts, and asked her to come up with an idea for a presentation that really focused on something new, uh, something exciting and, 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 and vibrant in the world of media arts. Never in a million years did I think she would come back with a suggestion that had radio in its name. But then I took a look at the work that the Association of Independence in Radio uh, was doing and agreed wholeheartedly with Alice's estimation. Uh, the woman I'm about to introduce, uh, I got to sit to next to last night at dinner. Uh, she is Fascinating. Uh, she's an artist. Uh, her background uh, and, and career has been fascinating. She's really an exceptional person. I'm looking forward to getting to know uh, her better. So please join me in welcoming the Executive Director of the American Association of Independence and Radio, Sue Schott. Thank you, Chairman Landerson, Council Members, NEA staff, uh, for all of your support that is so vital to the work that we're doing. Um, I'm, I'm honored and I'm so pleased to be here with you. So. Across the United States, in cities large and small, there's a group of new makers engaged in a great experiment, blending media, journalism, technology, art, storytelling, and social entrepreneurship. They're exploiting the power of the interconnected network of 1,200 public radio and television stations, and their work is giving rise to a new creative form that we call full-spectrum media. For some time now, we've been locked into a cycle of chaos driven by media technology, and it's actually one of the most inventive periods we'll see in our lifetime, a time when the most independent and creative spirits thrive. It's not easy, it's not restful, we're really tired, <laughs> and guess what? It's not going to last forever. For 40 years, those of us working in public media have developed a form that has served us and the public well. Six programming, pristine production values, editorial excellence. But the drive of new technology has shifted out from under this form, and we're now chasing a new form to suit new ubiquitous functions. New media is on demand. Phones are the new PC. Tablets, they didn't exist three years ago. Live music is outpacing revenues for recorded music. And video games, bigger than the movies. I've spent five years running an organization of producers, and I've learned that this demand for new forms is birthing an exciting new hybrid of makers, a new breed of talent working with ingenuity, passion, and purpose. 
we're learning that technology for technology's sake is meaningless. And our makers today are defining new uses of technology and bringing human purpose. I'll talk about what this new talent is, where to find it, and I'm going to show you how we're working with it to strengthen local communities. The paradigm has shifted, especially in the world of public radio. Sure, our talent is still producing wonderful short audio features, news reports, documentaries. They're adapting podcasting, taking advantage of new distribution systems. This is all true. Audio as a primary medium is not disappearing, but it is moving to a different place in a larger constellation. And in today's environment, talent is much more. If there's one image I want you to hold, it's this one. Independent makers in particular are flexible, they're masters of adaptation, they're passionate, and they are scary good at getting the job done. Producers are hackers, they figure out how to use the technology. They're adapting and shaping blended media crafts. They are risk takers. They're nimble. They're not bound by organizational constraints. If you think of Disney's Imagineering Lab, you need a new theme park, who are you going to call? You turn to the Imagineer. A giant walking, talking Mr. Potato Head? Again, you call the Imagineer. There are scores of job titles in the Imagineering Lab, illustrators, writers, architects, carpenters. And with AIR, we're like a contemporary Wiener Werkstatt. We have makers with nearly 100 areas of expertise, a broad, multidisciplinary coalition. Plus, our talent is utterly unique in the craft of public service media. So you ask, where is all this ninja talent? AIR will soon have 1,000 in every state in 20 countries worldwide. We're growing. 200 new producers in the last year, 64% under 34. They're racially diverse. Film, multimedia makers, technologists, print reporters. We have tap roots into public media stations, into the newsrooms, and importantly, into the local communities. And it's spreading like crazy. Talent is everywhere. Let me tell you about Localore. Localore is an ambitious national production underway. You see, once we recognized the new potential of our makers, we were able to reimagine them as agents to help us expand our public service mission. We're working with a brilliant new story first technology group, Ziga. Together with our producers and our stations, we've set into motion a new 21st century program for action. We have the opportunity as never before to plant new seeds in our local communities, an opportunity as never before to turn to our makers and give them a new assignment to help us realize public media's founding vision as a service for all of America. How have we activated them? A year ago, we launched a broad national local lore competition. We called out to producers across the United States. We said, bring us your ideas and your ingenuity to take a new assignment. We called out to the radio and television stations. We said, we want to send you talent and resources Join us in a new collaboration, and together we can strengthen our local communities. We now have a dozen lead producers embedded at 10 stations, and we have hundreds of stations, technical, community collaborators working nationwide. Their mantra, go outside. Go outside your mindset, your traditional approach to craft, and physically go outside. This is La Beluha, the bubble. It's a portable sound booth we've built at Sonic Trace, KCRW. It, capture, it captures anonymous stories from immigrants living in the Corexico section of LA. So what are all these producers creating? This full spectrum media I spoke of earlier, blending digital, broadcast, and street media in regions across the US, from rural outposts to coastal, coastal urban matrices to the open plains of mid-America. Our lead producers include filmmakers, radio producers, multimedia makers, coders, developers. We've got a game designer, and we've established a talent skunk work operating inside traditional operations. So the message I have to leave you with today is this. We are in the midst of the most exciting, inventive period of our lifetime. We have a new it's generation of talent in our midst, and we are turning to them to say, the lead us in a new direction. Products. Use your skill and your inspiration. And Harness new technology. Strengthen our human connections. And guess what? They're taking us to, to blend technology new in new ways. Build station R&D capacity. Tell local stories. And expand public media beyond its core to more citizens. 
Here's a snapshot of the story so far. The Kitchen Sisters and KQED are launching a new series, The Making of, What People Make in the Bay Area and Why. You have 87 new messages. We make hand-built chicken coops in Petaluma, California. I've built probably about 30,000 surfboards. I make the future. I'm helping to write a law to switch San Francisco to a 100% solar-powered society within the next 10 years. Every year there's a big event called Blessing of the Bikes. 5,000 motorcycles, mainly Harleys, show up and get blessed with holy water at the start of the rally season. Jay Love in the yellow shirt is a member of the Dayton Roadrunners. Dayton Roadrunners is a motorcycle club and we're mostly affiliated with work people. You know, your job and your family come first, then we do the motorcycle stuff. We need the economy to get better, jobs to stay here so Dayton can grow again. Curiosity. The city is not only a fertile ground for our curiosity, the city itself is merely a secret mechanical invention created by curiosity. Que lejos estoy del suelo donde nací. Kimmy, do you remember when my mom left? Yeah, I remember it very well. She went to go pick me up from school. On our way back home, she had told me how much that she loved me. I was just like, okay, mom, I love you too. <laughs> I just found it very weird that she would say that. And when we got home, I saw a bunch of black bags in the living room. And so I knew in my heart, even though I was nine years old, I knew that she was leaving us. And I just, I was so angry. I threw everything I saw in my sight. I just threw it at her. And then I ran into the bathroom. And when I got out of the bathroom, she was gone. From Chinese takeout restaurants in Boston, to the oil fields of North Dakota, to the West Coast, and points in between, local or producers are leading hundreds of station, technical, and community collaborators to show us new possibilities for public media. So far, 9.1 million touches across broadcast, digital, and street media platforms. And over the next several months, will launch a series of new interactive documentary sites, which will bring even deeper engagement with citizens in local communities. And we're only halfway there. There's more to come. Thank you. Neat. Uh, thanks so much, Sue. Let's open up the discussion uh, with council members. If there's any questions or comments? You gave kind of an overview talking last night. Could you kind of give a brief overview of your organization and all of the different things that there's an organization based in Boston. Um, it's going to be celebrating 25 years, so it's been around for a while. And in the last five years, I would say we've had quite a, uh, again, driven by the technology principally, we've had quite a, a renaissance, I would say. We're comprised of as I said, uh, 800, uh, 860 members right now. It's a membership organization. 
um, from independent basement studio types of independent producers all the way up to NPR, PRI, the BBC, the networks all belong. So the founding inspir inspirational kind of principle are, are those who believe in the power of the individual inspired maker. We have programs, uh, we cover basically three areas. Um, we identify and bring talent together. So we have, again, a very vibrant and engaged network. Um, we cultivate the talent. And the talent cultivation takes the form of mentoring programs, trainings, and intensives. We have scholarships. And we have this crazy, uh, I call it, uh, we call it the inner sanctum, which is just a, it's a hinky list, old school lister. But it's a place where our members on a daily basis, 20 up or 7, are engaged in uh, identifying uh, opportunity. You need a reporter in Brisbane, Australia tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock. You put it on the list, serve, boom, you, you get the, your reporter. You need to solve a technical problem. You put it out on the list, serve. They're genius technical people. Boom, you get your solution. So it's this enormous resource brain trust in itself. Local or represents the third aspect of our work, which is um, deployment of our talent. We identify problems. We identify where this, again, this vitality and this energy, this creative energy, can have some impact in, and help, uh, in this case, uh, expand the mission of public media and help it through this difficult period of transformation. Anything else? We're good? Thank you very much, Sue. Thank That's you. great. <laughs> OK. Uh, my final piece of business is to announce that the National Council on the Arts has reviewed the applications and guidelines presented to them, and a tally of the council members' ballots reveals that all recommendations for funding and rejection have passed. Are there any additional comments, questions, or discussions from the council members? I would like to thank the entire